Wow, that is a whopper. That's got to be one of the largest teeth. You wouldn't want to have toothache in that tooth, would you? One of the things you are bound to notice on parts of the Thames foreshore is an abundance of animal bones and teeth. Why are they here? Where did they come from? Chances are many of them come from centuries old kitchens and butchers, eating houses, inns and taverns. These objects are something I often overlook and don't pay a lot of attention to. Recently, I met with the artist Amy Lee Bird, who uses Thames found bones and teeth as creative inspiration for her artwork, bringing them and other discarded and unwanted objects into the limelight. When people are on the foreshore, I think they do tend to bypass the bones and look for more treasures as such. Um, and I just like being the one not to. <laughs> You've got pink little wellies on as well, just like us. <laughs> so I just saw this. She's got one of those massive... Oh yeah, so it's it. actually part of the jawbone it's with the huge in tooth in it. Oh my cool. goodness, that's got to come from a massive great cow, cow or something. I think. Yeah. They're stunning. I normally find the bigger ones separated, but... I mean, that would be such a beautiful photograph because you can see all the, the holes and the details here, the kind of like, um, the membrane of the bone, is that what you want to call it? Yeah. Or sometimes like I could just photograph in there and that would be a print. It's really abstract, it looks like a small kind of landscape in a way. I think I'll keep this. I think I would describe my work as earthy. <laughs> Uh, for obvious reasons, you know, there's this kind of like natural earthy nature to particularly the bones um, and a lot of people think that my prints of bones look like rocks in a lot of cases, particularly in one of my latest pieces which you'll see later. Um, I guess I would describe, I think I would describe particularly the bone work as quite macabre um, or because you know we're dealing with dead material um, and there's this sort of strange fascination with life after death and the life of these animals, humans, who knows. <laughs> and I think I'd probably use um, the word nostalgic uh, because one, these are objects from a different time and a different life, but also they, ref they help me to reflect upon my own life and my own experiences with materials, objects, my environment. Um, so I'd say probably in a weird way nostalgic is the, the kind of the word that I'd use at the top of the list. But I'm sure there's loads of others. Dirty. <laughs> oh yeah, so I'm I'm collecting kind of white and blue shards at the minute. Um, because I want to make another sort of sculptural orb out of these. Um, I don't know, I can just visualise it in my head. I'm not sure if it's going to work yet, but I mean, we've only been here sort of 20 minutes and I found three, four pieces already. Excellent. So a nice orb with the pottery that you All collect. covered with the blue and white sort of, um, what's it called? Blue willow? Yeah. Pottery? Yes, quite that is willow here. plate. Yeah, that is willow plate. It's beautiful. That's yeah. such a good idea. Is your um, orb that you made out of bones at the gallery? Uh, it was. The exhibition's just finished, but oh. I have a show coming up and it's going to be in there. I did another one, I don't know if you saw, with oyster shells. And you've, I found some massive ones here. I mean, like, really, really big oyster shells. It's amazing. And I found that um, what I noticed is that, I mean, one, you can tell when they're really old and when they're not because... Uh, I was collecting down sort of just underneath Borough Market mm -hmm. and there was the really old ones that had been sort of um, eaten, you know, by the, the sponge coral. Yes. What's it called? Um, I think it's called Boring Sponge and it eats away at all these tiny little holes in the shell, which looks very decorative and very beautiful. 
Um, but then you could see where fresh shells had come and they still had the meat on the inside of the shell. And they didn't have the sort of thick layers mm -hmm. that the older ones did, which I found quite interesting. I also used to visit London a lot with my dad. And there, there is a moment actually <laughs> when um, he took me to see the Richard Long retrospective at the Tate Modern. I think I mentioned this mm. to you previously and um, it just blew my mind. I think I was about 12 or 13 and I loved the exhibition so much that when we left the tide was low, it was out um, on the foreshore and I made my own little rock circle piece then and I think from then on it's just kind of stuck with me this idea of coming down to the waters and there's also something about being at the water's edge that is um, calming you know it's quite calm to be here right now there's no one else here it's quiet yeah it's it's the whole experience um, it's really rewarding I've seen this one as well which I think um, is a pig's jaw Okay. Someone said that another one that I'd found like this was a pig's and I think it's you can tell because of the shape of the teeth. Can I look? Yeah, of course. When was it that you first realised that bones were something that you were really drawn to to use in your art? Um it took it took a while because I didn't really know what I was looking for. But I think it's because I noticed that there were so many of them. That intrigued me. It was like walking on an open graveyard, you know, particularly over Cannon Street side. That there's just, I can't really describe it. It's, um, it's kind of just rows and rows and rows of bones, all of a similar shape and size and colour. Um, and I think it just sort of fascinated me a little bit, and it, it started there. This sort of I felt compelled to pick them up and take them home, and then I started photographing them. And it kind of naturally progressed from there. Collecting uh, kind of gives me, it's both freeing and it gives me an element of control. Um, and I, I don't know, I've always seen beauty in things that were unwanted or discarded. It's just a kind of addictive, sensation that when you find something you think oh, that's pretty and it stands out to you then you can you can touch it and it's that tactility as well that I really love about mudlarking and collecting and I don't know if I mentioned this to you before but I lost quite a lot of my childhood toys when I was younger we moved house and somewhere in the move I just I think a lot of things were thrown out and left behind um, and it didn't really bother me much until my early 20s when I moved away from home and it kind of I kind of noticed it then I thought about it then a lot and I think that's when I started collecting like this originally in my first or second year of uni and then more, most recently with the lockdown I think a lot of people have been reaching back to the things that bring them happiness and I think my toys used to bring me a lot of happiness and because I don't have them I think it's a way of replacing the things that have been lost. Um, yeah, so that definitely feeds into why I, I do this. Look, look at that. Oh, look at the roots on it. Oh, wow, that's a two and a half. That's stunning. That's really nice. Normally, these bits aren't as protruding when I find them. They've normally been sort of chopped Cut off. off. Yeah, it's really got the roots there. Did you say you'd already done something with teeth or are you working on something? Yes, I've nearly finished the piece. Um, I'm making a few boards, which I don't know really if you count them as a painting or a sculpture, but I've, I've stuck all of the teeth all going in one direction. They've kind of slotted in like a jigsaw. Um, I've been using teeth for that and I'm nearly finished. Just got the last few to fill in. And I kind of want to do more than just the one, you know, I think it's, I think it's about 40 centimetres by 40 centimetres, so mm -hmm. it's not huge. I've got a new piece that I'm working on, 
which is actually a work of art that I'm going to wear. Um, I'm quite, I've, I've been looking into corsets and obviously old corsets used to be made out of whalebone and I thought how could I, I wanted to wear something, I wanted to wear something to one of my exhibition openings. Um, so I've been collecting sort of smaller bones like this and I bought myself a, like a bodice at the weekend and I'm going to stick them on in, I don't know actually, I'm not really sure, I've not started yet, but I'm going to stick all these little bones onto this bodice and then I'm going to buy a suit that I wear over the top. And I, might, I might make some um, heels as well. Ooh. Out of bone? Yeah, with the bones. What's this? Is this bone or tooth? Well, that's bone. Oh, that's bone, isn't it? Yeah, that's the kind of piece that would go on my corset. Would it? Oh, there you go. Thank you. I can't wait to see this corset. Uh, me neither. I'm kind of um, I'm a bit apprehensive about how it's going to look in the end. Hopefully it looks as good as it does in my head. Well, I love the smoothness of them, you know, where they've been eroded away by the tide coming in and out and in and out, and they've got this sort of beautifully smoothed appearance. I quite like it when there's a hole in them. Mm. You can hang them. Just, I just uh, made a piece recently called Bleak Beauty, and I'd I've got a load of bones like this and I hung them with clear fishing wire, so they looked like they were just suspended in the air. And it's always useful when I don't have to drill holes through them. <laughs> <laughs> you just use the natural that. holes. I've seen quite a lot of um, hill packets today. I feel like, in a way, I could photograph those and make prints from them. I mean, that as well. Uh, when I was a kid, my mum used to get these um, juice cartons. Mm -hmm. And they're really cheap and really gross. <laughs> and you had a little straw that you poked in the top and it had a film. I remember those. <laughs> um, I remember having those. There, we just spotted some more jaw. That's gorgeous. You can see it coming out the other side as well. Whoop, is that a good bit? Yeah, that's a brilliant bit. Look at that. That would make a gorgeous print. Looks quite, um, uh, what's it, Aztec? You know, with the kind of shapes. Yeah. Yeah, you're making me see uh, bones and teeth in a completely different way. It's just the pattern. Yeah, so, mm. so from that side, obviously, it looks more like your kind of general jawbone. But if you turn it round, I'd probably photograph it and then print it like that. It's to showcase the beauty of these objects to other people. Because um, I think that they're beautiful. And if I think that they're beautiful, then I must be able to uh, highlight that for other people. That looks like a really nice bit. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's a little tiny scene. Oh, got two God. little people on there. Isn't that lovely? That's great. Give it a rinse off so we can have a better look at it. Yeah, that's lovely. That is rather beautiful, isn't it? That is. Good spot. Particularly since moving to London. I don't get much time, I feel, to just be with my own thoughts. And that's not a problem, but it's... I think when I come down here, it's just a bit of time when I don't really have to think about anything apart from not falling over and what I'm looking at. <laughs> um, which is, you know, I think it's necessary because we all need to stop at some point. Um, and I guess this is my bit of time to just stop. some of the prints that have come over this side. Oh yeah, haven't quite made the cut for the edition because of some minor flaw. Like there'll be some kind of inconsistency in the in the wiping down. Okay. So this um, is a bone that you found 
on the terms for sure what is the process then that you have used to create this print mm. so i'll take my photographic image and i'll make uh, an acetate like this smaller actually this one is for a screen print but you know you get the idea and I'll expose it uh, onto the light sensitive plate in a, in a light, light box unit and then you develop it in water and so the light let me get this right the light hardens the surface of the polymer so wherever there are darker bits it will eat away into the plate and when you wash it it will it will lift out, creating the various kind of depths, you know, mm -hmm. within the plate. So where it's darker, that's obviously where the ink will hold more. So this, this is like, this here is the plate. Okay. You know, it's got a metal back, so it gives it some sturdiness. And then this sort of yellowy green, uh, this is the light sensitive polymer. So it was this that you know, you expose your image onto. Once you've made your plate, like like so, um, you need it to harden, so you can either post harden it in the light machine, or you can just leave it out by the window and mm -hmm. natural light will harden it. I tend to do that. So then you'll get your etching ink and you'll pull it across the plate. You then use scrim to wipe it down in a, a circular motion, lifting the ink off bit by bit every yeah. time. Um, you must do it evenly, otherwise it won't come out <laughs> properly. Until you've got the right consistency, and normally you can see when it's about right, because when you hold your plate, all of this area here, the ink would have wiped off, and it will be, you know, hold, like it will be holding in these sort of dark areas. Yeah. And then you soak your paper in a water bath. You can see here, everyone's got their paper in the bath, soaking. So softening, and generally you want to leave it about 40 minutes to an hour. Yeah, so once you've pulled out of the bath, you then you stick it straight to here, and it will just stick to the, the wall, and use a squeegee to get the excess off. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you take it, and you, can, you, can, you have to blot it as well. So when I was at uni, you used to blot it in between towels, but here you use blotting sheets and you just get off the excess water so there's no puddles, you don't want any puddles of water and then it's ready to lay on your plate and print. So you would uh, line up your acetate, this isn't my acetate, this is someone else's but just to illustrate how you would, then you would place your inked up plate down like so, then you would lay your dampened paper on top, pull over these blankets and run it through Ah, press. okay. And then that's how you get the um So that's how you get the finished product. The bone from the plate there onto mm -hmm. the onto the paper. paper.
Now one of the projects which I was particularly fascinated with that Amy did was involving a sheet and the water of the River Thames. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me a little bit about it please? Yeah of course, so actually you can see here this rope is where I had attached the canvas and I draped it over the edge so as the water was coming in and out and in and out every day it would mark and stain the canvas itself. So I pulled it out in January and uh, I stretched it over a frame for an exhibition um, and I kind of, I was under pressure, I was in a rush as well because the exhibition was like there, now we're opening. So as I was stretching it, it was very delicate because it had been in there for about nine weeks, which is a really long time and it tore a bit but um, it's in the gallery still, uh, number 20 in Highbury and I just had it on show and it, it got a lot of um, Got a lot of traction, is that the mm -hmm. word? To Attention, use? yeah. Attention, traffic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just a lot of a lot of people were a bit like, oh, what is it? You know, and it's when you, I said to people that it's been in the river, they were kind of shocked by just all the different tones and, and colours that were on it. You'd think that it would just come out as sort of one mm. or blank canvas as such. So when I came in the January, it was freezing. I mean, it was so cold. And I pulled the canvas out. Um, there was wind, like, blowing really, really, like, the waves on Thames were really rough. And I remember, like, going up the ladder and I didn't have any gloves on. And it was just so cold. Like, my hands almost felt like they were going to, like, stick <laughs> to, the, to the steps. You know, like, as a kid, you feel this temptation to, like, put your tongue on ice <laughs> that's what it was like it was you know I thought oh my god my hands aren't gonna come off it was it was a painful experience so this piece um, actually oh is that Thames mud then is that Thames, Thames Thames mud and water okay so the screen print itself didn't work out um, particularly well but I thought I might as well use it as an experimental piece anyway oh so, okay yeah so you've got yeah, I can see the bones there. So you've screen printed this huge piece of fabric with the bones. Let's zoom in on those bones. Yeah. And that's all Thames mud and Thames water. And, and Thames what are you going to do now? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure really. I think I'll probably um, let it, I'll hang it out to dry and see how it looks because you know obviously it always looks different to when it's wet when it's dry um i made another one which i'll show you yeah um where the bones are a little bit more clear but you know i just love looking at all these different gradients of color like here you know where it's it's spiked up and around here you know you've got this sort of faint bone and it's framing it so it's sort of letting the thames do the sort work. of play with the canvas and seeing what it comes up with. Yeah, basically, it's kind of taking that element of, you know, printmaking is so process orientated, it's quite controlled. Um, and even though I never know how a print is going to come out, I generally have a good idea. But with this, you know, I, n I never know how it's going to come out at <laughs> all. Um, so is that, that element of chance and reward? you know, when it works well. I won't stretch this one, I think I'll just hang it freely and you know, as it moves it will kind of um, illustrate the, the water itself. So there's lots of little kind of metaphors to be read into it. And this one is the second attempt of the screen print. I'll just move this out of the way. Um, and you can kind of you can see the bones a little bit more clearly and I haven't yet tampered with this one quite like it as it is but also oh yeah I can see the teeth there now yeah so it that's it's the same image as that but you know you can actually see the imagery a lot more clearly so I'm not sure whether to go down a similar route or just kind of I'm not sure it's, it's a work in progress yeah so I'm, I'm going big at the minute go big or go home <laughs> so Amy where can people see your work 
Um, so mostly I put all of my work on Instagram. That's my kind of daily blog. Um, and I'll have pieces on there which are finished, which, you know, if you're ever interested, if anyone's ever interested, they can always drop into my DMs. I love hearing from new people. Um, I do have a website as well, which I'm in the process of updating. Um, and that's just amyleebird.com. You should be able to find my work there. Yeah. And exhibitions? Well, I've just had an exhibition, so I've got some work um, on the website of the Number 20 Gallery, uh, based in Highbury and Islington, Angel Way. They've got a whole catalogue of my work. So, yeah, we can just keep an eye on your Instagram site to find out where these exhibitions are. And... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I plug everything on my Instagram. <laughs> That's where it all goes, really. I've got a bone in my bag, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if it might be something that you might be able to use to make a print. It's actually part of a turtle rib bone. And yeah, first of all, I thought, what on earth is this? Is it some kind of fossilized feather? Is it a pen? God. But it's, it's really beautiful. And I just wondered whether you might be able to make something with this. Yes! Oh my God, it's gorgeous. So that's the underside, right? Um, so the underside of the of the stomach. So yeah, I then. think so. And, and actually, um, I've got some nice diagrams at home showing how it all fits Whereabouts. together. But that's the rib, oh, I believe. So beautiful. And so I found it in a nice old sort of Georgian dump site. So I can only imagine that it was probably in a turtle soup. But it would be amazing to see it actually <gasps> immortalised in a print. It's gorgeous. I'm so glad that I'm getting to hold it. Also, I, I mean, I have a, a kind of special affinity with tortoises anyway, because my nan has, well, she had three, she's now got two, and I've always been around them since I was a kid. Um, and they're just such beautiful animals. I would love to make a print of this. Mm -hmm.